Okay, let's start. So, um, welcome to the last conference of this amazing uh, eighth edition of our symposium. I'm glad to present you Dwight Gilbert Jones, who is going to speak about direct initiative for a new humanism as part of the central team of this symposium, humanism is the current situation. Dwight Gilbert Jones uh, studied physics at McGill University, philosophy at Simon Fraser University, and then graduated bioscience at UC Berkeley. Rejecting the British analytic uh, linguistic school, he left academia in the 1970s to become a network designer facial fraction, fractal imaging, wireless internet, and a small businessman. In 1998, he embraced inclusive humanism as his personal philosophy and wrote the speculative humanist series, series uh, 1000, human, uh, 1000 Summer in uh, uh, 2010, followed by continuance in 2019, to explore world federalism and to critic militarism, our uh, cultural cancer, as fundamental issue for humanism. His view is that additional life cycles based on DNA sweatership are imminent can fulfill the as aspiration evident in all religions and be a motivator towards harmonizing our with ourselves, our sister species and planet humanism, becoming man common credo. I don't want to take any more time from the intervention of Dwight Gilbert Jones. So, uh, Dwight, when you are, when you want, you can start. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, yes, uh, I, I'm just going to read my uh, my paper, if that's okay. I'll probably interject some comments along the way. Uh, so what I'm doing here is these are direct initiatives that I'm suggesting for the credo of humanism <clears throat> as we try to build uh, more awareness within our species uh, of humanism itself. Uh, usually each generation puts forward its own manifesto as to what it's supposed to be but it doesn't seem to be getting much traction vis-a-vis -vis orthodox religions, even most of a century past that. So first I'll read the abstract so that everybody's on side. Uh, and, then, and then I think it's just a four page paper, so it shouldn't take too long um, to just read through it rather than just a bunch of comments by myself. Uh, the abstract is, uh, humanism is seeking fresh perspectives toward a collective species credo. Here I present some opinion on the human diet, the diabetes epidemic, militarism, and world governance. The, these are everyday humanist issues. And I interject my own vision of humanists embracing an option to retrace new lives through regeneration. If transhumanism is to be viewed seriously, then DNA stewardship is a conservative hedge. I'll just explain for a second what DNA stewardship means to me. Um, uh, this, I think you can see this. This is a DNA capsule. I think you can see it here. It unscrews from one end. It has a very high, high quality, high strength 
my DNA in it. And when it's preserved like that in a laboratory, it, it remains viable for human reproduction for centuries. I mean, if you, can, if you can figure out the genome of a Neanderthal, they can figure you out 10, 20, 30 years from now. So the idea is my seed is in here. Our seed can be treated like that. And so that's what I mean by DNA stewardship. You, you put your DNA in the care of a society and you attach a smart contract to it, which says, if you regenerate me in five years, 50 years, 100 years, the money in the smart contract is yours. And so I've started a society. You can see the little red dot, dot up on the wall. That's basically not much more than a society that you would put a private golf club together with. But it can be very powerful. I used to admin, administer amateur sports that way <clears throat> through a society that I founded. It was very successful. So at least I know what I'm doing in that regard. So I'm just going to read through this so you understand what I mean by DNA stewardship. It means looking after it first in the lab and then through a society. And then at the proper time, you uh, through, through a process called ectogenesis, probably an artificial womb, they regenerate yourself. It's not your child. It's not your parents. It's 100% yourself. So my attitude has been, we can do this now. We don't have to wait for the future. This isn't transhumanism. This is, this is social organization. This is, this is humanism. And, and, and it is this kind of human aspiration, which has been the driver for Orthodox religion since before recorded time. So, recognizing our genotype as our personal franchise in life. It is your franchise in life, your, your DNA. And with its low tech, I mean, this is very low tech. This is just room temperature. Don't let it get hot. Don't let it get wet. It's good for centuries. It's what, it's what they were thinking about in, in Roma when they put the catacombs in with the priesthoods of the day. Same deal. So it's low-tech preservation by a dedicated society enables sequential life cycles inside the inclusive envelope of humanism. So I'm thinking that um, having an envelope of humanism around these activities uh, is the healthy way to bring it forward. I don't think I'm the next Mussolini and I don't think anybody has to be uh, to, 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 to bring along our species with an option to enjoying our virgin planet one more, one more or, or many more lifetimes. So I've broken this into, that's, that's my abstract. I've bro broken this into three directions I would like to see humanism take. One is proper human diet. The second is proper human governance through the UN. And then finally, I talk about what regeneration would actually look like. And, and, and I read about it. This is, this is a book I wrote in 1990 called uh, The Humanist. And in it, I'm the name of it is 1000 Summers. You can find it on uh, Amazon under Dwight Gilbert Jones. And basically it's saying we should, we should dedicate ourselves as a species. If we need a new manifesto for humanism, uh, let's say, why don't we take a thousand years, which is nothing in geologic time, a flash, uh, and harmonize ourselves 
with the planet, with our sister species, like the whales and all of biodiversity, and harmonize ourselves with each other. Because we are really right now a species of killer apes. And the 20th century has demonstrated for everybody that we are killer apes who most enjoy killing each other. <clears throat> so humanists are, are one of the few ways I can see our species coming together. So let's talk about a proper human diet because I think it's fundamental that, that humanists become critics and apologists for our species. They have to criticize things like a, a, a human diet because let's, let's, read, let's read through this a bit and, and you'll see what I mean. If Renaissance humanism was a rediscovery of the Greek and Roman era, then the new humanism can revisit the 19th century for a proper, oh, sorry, for a po postmodern idea of what the proper human diet once was, but isn't now. At first glance, the 20th century was one of plenty. As the Green Revolution multiplied yields with hybrids, agriculture was mechanized, fertilized, and of course, pesticides. The world population quadrupled, tracking this latter abundance. People were taller, lived longer, and the bacterial plagues that haunted humanity became a thing of the past. Recently, US researcher, Dr. Chris Snobie, discovered disturbing data from the 1800s records of a Harvard hospital. Since the Massachusetts, Massachusetts General Hospital's founding in 1811 up to 1900, this is hard to believe, there was no mention of heart attacks, cancer, or diabetes, and obesity was rare. Dr. Nobi terms these the diseases of civilization and attributes the creation of cheap seed oils it sounds like I'm a little bit crazy through these things, but listen to me. Cheap seed oils and factory food for the onset of our modern metabolic ailments, which is what big pharma calls it, metabolic disease. They don't want you to talk about diabetes. Currently, more than 70% of American adults are overweight, pre-diabetic, and or obese. <clears throat> so, Essentially, these people are sick, and it's going around the world. It's a disease of civilization. Even the Japanese are getting fat. You've probably noticed it over in Europe and down in South America. People are getting fat. <clears throat> a public relations war on meat, fundamental to human evolution, has been championed via a century-old long linking between the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Kellogg Corporation. They both have their headquarters in Battle Creek, Michigan, and they have had for a century. People don't realize this in Michigan. In each version of the U.S. dietary guidelines since 1980, red meat is demonized, yet school lunch legislation allows that ketchup qualifies as a vegetable. That's, that's, that's not nutrition. The science says that humans evolved our big brain by becoming lipivores, who successfully hunted fatty prey. Lipids are fat, of course. So long before humans, the energy system of any mammal, and we're not the first mammal, was fixed on ketones, which is little globules of fat. That's what our energy system runs on. Yet cheap factory foods made up of highly refined oils, grains, and sugars increasingly dominate human diets worldwide. Today, insulin resistance is said to be the progenitor of at least 60% of major illnesses. That's the key word is insulin resistance. If you have insulin res high insulin, it means you've got too much sugar running around in you. And you're, you're sick. 
if malnutrition in, in residential care homes had been averted by responsible medical direction and the lessons of TB san sanitariums for tuberculosis for a century, which was vitamin D deficiency, if that was respected, the COVID pandemic would be acknowledged as instead a highly contagious seasonal flu. The, the mortality is 0.02%, which nobody would ever consider that to be a pandemic. It's just a silly use of the word. It's a contagious flu. However, to recognize the actual T2 diabetes pandemic, that is what is the real pandemic, and obesity epidemics underway would have exposed medical authorities to unwelcome scrutiny. Once the public understands that dementia, Alzheimer's, is likely caused by chronic malnutrition, then we can make rational choices like real food. But the, but, but the public has to know this. They have to know these facts. Doctors may sneer and laugh about it all, but the science of nutrition is discussed in depth among peer researchers on YouTube. Just as we are on YouTube now, it's real learning, it's not a joke. Unfortunately, the children's crusade of veganism promoted by the Coca-Cola genre of pop nutrition, exploits bottomless ad funding that dwarfs any notice of online medical resources. You won't see ads to look this up on YouTube. It's not gonna happen, but you'll see lots of ads that will tell you that Coca-Cola is a plant-based nutrition. Sure. Compliant heart and diabetes associations understand that the self, central health issue is carbohydrates and frequent eating. Humans cannot burn sugar instead of fat, nor continue to use our pancreas, which is a little organ right here. We can't use that like a glucose carburetor, but we do. Humans are not adapted to carbohydrates as a nutrient source and never shall be. We've been farmers for 10,000 years. That's just a flash of time. Historically, our diet evolved based on animal sources and it would take at least a thousand years to change that. We must plan otherwise. Eggs are our heroes. I know I probably mentioned it later, but one solution is to restore native grasslands, soils and water tables to support sensitive grazing. There's a wonderful initiative in the uh, Russian steppes, in the Siberian steppes, which used to be populated with mastodons and musk oxes and, and woolly lots of things. And when they didn't tamp down the soil anymore or tamp down the snow in the winter, it, de it developed about a meter of snow that we see there now, which keeps the tundra from freezing properly. Otherwise it would be exposed to extreme cold all winter long and freeze hard. Now, it's, now it is thawing out. So they're trying to reintroduce mammoths and, 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 and musk oxes and this kind of, you know, large fat animals, uh, again, because if the tundra melts, it will probably release a lot of methane and there's every probability that we will turn into Venus on this planet. Simply, it may be too late already to do that. So big food packages a suite of addictive chemicals, sugars, and refined grains, largely with seed oils, a liter of soy oil, which has never been part of the human diet, costs less than a dollar US. So they pour that into the food. And there's more processing of 
of that food, that seed oil, which is, they call it vegetable oil, but there's no oil in vegetables. Um, there's more processing in that oil than in motor oil. And Dr. Grenobi explains how they needed something to do with this byproduct from cotton, cotton seed oil, about 1850. And it got turned into a food called Crisco about 1920. And the American Heart Association was born and took money from them. It's total corruption. As they say in socialism, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And if there's money on the table from lobbyists, it's, it's done. Every school child, care home resident, soldier, pensioner, and prison inmate is a helpless prisoner of their factory food game. Soy oil adds 700 calories per day to the average American diet. That's a lot. The poor must buy into whatever cheap cal calories are on offer. Women are particularly victimized because they have to cook it. One solution is to restore native grasslands, soils, and water tables to support sensitive grazing. In other words, we have to start being shepherds again. <clears throat> The science is there, it's right there on YouTube. You can watch physiologists and PhDs in every kind of biochemistry discuss this, and they don't sit there and lie to each other. You can learn this. I learned it a year ago, well, maybe a year and three, at the beginning of COVID. Uh, I weighed about 12 kilos more than I weigh now. And over that period of time, I lost it. Because I think what happens is you have a genetic weight. And then you have, you can add a certain number of kilos from carbs. But if you eliminate the carbs, you fall back to your genetic weight. So there's no such thing as weight loss. It's, it's just how many carbs have you eaten? That's the truth. Uh, and exercise does nothing at all for, for weight loss. So I feel sorry for overweight joggers. I used to be one. As a humanist philosopher, I attempt to be an honest critic and proud apologist for our beleaguered homo sapiens. Lamenting the events, horrific events of the 20th century, I too am assailed by visions of robots. This is where I get conservative about being humanists. Artificial intelligence, the singularity, transhumanism. Will the new humanism be backward compatible with the old? And should we expect it to be? Or, or will we care that humanism is relevant at all? Or are we all just going to buy into this AI and singularity and transhumanism and uploading our, our brains to some place and pretend it's us. Isn't it easier just to stay ourselves for another thousand years and, and tidy up the house? I have become a radical conservative on the future of our physical makeup. A radical conservative, it's almost like an oxymoron. Expecting that within this 21st century, there may indeed be competition facing standard issue humans like ourselves. Artificial intelligence would be an intimidating presence and likely presents the biggest challenge to humans since bacteria. In recent times, human character has been downright cheesy, which means it stinks, human character. The first task of humanism, this is after, our, after all our governance here, it is to end militarism, which would corrupt, take corrupted artificial intelligence, robotics, absolutely. It would, they, they would just love that. Robots killing each other. This lies completely within our species control. So it's really up to us to point out 
to human beings that we can, we can get rid of militarism tomorrow morning. We are now four generations past the formation of the League of Nations. It is time to anchor human democracy with blockchain certainty. What was interesting is, it's off topic, but this morning I, I sold my, my Twitter ID, which is at humanism, for one Bitcoin to uh, an account, uh, probably a billionaire in Boston, so that I can build a smart contract for my next life. So humanism is sacrificing itself as of this morning to fund my next life. And it's totally, totally with this and humanism, it's a sure thing. Unless I allow it to fail. Just an interesting side note. <laughs> um, Arms races and war have bankrupted Homo sapiens relentlessly, and it has to end now. It has to end now. Some wonderful discussion on nuclear arms on previously that I was watching as much as I could through my language barrier. Um, here's the UN voting against it, and we have the militarists saying, no way, go away. We have to stop them. They're not going to leave the stage. They're like epidemiologists today with COVID. They're not going to leave. It's finally their day on the sun, in the sun. Someone will have to tell them to go home and allow the summer sunshine to bring up vitamin D, which is our central hormone for fighting upper respiratory infections. Anyway, rogue nations like the United States and pirate lobbyists that run the United States and Britain are holding our future hostage and they must be dealt with by this generation. Manufacturing weapons of war, not just nuclear weapons. That's in my first book from 2010. They, they, it must be criminalized. It must become a criminal act to manufacture a weapon of war. But nobody's talking about it. When was the last time you heard that comment? And it's obvious. So humanism is very terribly underexposed. But we need all of us to push these ideas out, to have humanism known as a fountain of ideas not just a license to be nice, which is what we've been traveling with for the last 500 years. <clears throat> it is important to share the load and responsibility as Confucius taught across everybody's shoulders. We share the load, we pay our taxes to the UN and we share the responsibility, but somebody has to step up and tell those other people to stop doing that. And humanists have to do that. So that's militarism. I think it's all obvious, obvious to any humanist. Not enough people are demanding change on things like war manufacturing and weapons culture. <clears throat> now the future of human reproduction. A little critical thinking is sufficient to dismiss transhumanism out of hand. And yet it's more popular than humanism. We are, we are a lonely species with a single car genus. In other words, there's only one of us left in the, in the genus because we killed off the Neanderthals. I was pretty sure we did it too. Certainly we didn't bring them along very for long. Even that toehold on existence, we have, we're the last species that was once a genus. It will be erased if we drift off to become conscious beings in the cloud. What the hell is that compared to a human being? 
or some mechanical simulacrum of ourselves, robots. I don't care how smart a robot is. And if robots do this, then allow me to suggest another direction to address rising human infertility, regeneration. Human, here, here I am suggesting a new way for human beings to reproduce themselves with the full, the full, full genetic complement. Why would we do that? Why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we uh, continue what we're doing? Uh, well, because to use uh, an inappropriate word, and it sounds like I'm crazy, but I probably am. Um, but your children are half-breeds, and they are not you, believe it or not. Nothing is as good as you. As a philosopher, people say, um, what is the meaning of life? And I always answer the same thing. The meaning of life is more life. Nothing else comes close. Okay? If you think about it, about what the meaning of life is, it's your next life. Okay. So the interesting thing about, or the, the compelling thing about infertility is it's going down 1% a year, our ability to reproduce. And women are getting impatient <laughs> because it's a big task for women. It sounds like we can put up with 1% 1, 1 a year for, for human infertility, but this has been going on now for 40 years. So our fertility is already down 40%. So we are about to lose our ability to reproduce entirely. When I was back at Berkeley learning their excellent biology program, the good professor in, in, in a university like Berkeley, a good one, the, the professor in first year, he probably wrote the books. And, and this guy had. And he said, in mammals, if, 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 if once, they, once there's too many of them, like lemmings that jump off a cliff, once there's too many of, of them, when they can smell each other's bums, their fertility falls away. And that's what's probably happening with human beings. There's too many of us, and nature knows better, and so fertility is falling away. So I think we can supplement it with regeneration. Until proven otherwise, there's no reason why we can't. Futurist visions of cyborgs are abnegations of everyday human experience. Everyday human experience. The great philosopher Epicurus, he said, what, what's the point uh, uh, of examining life the only thing that's important is, is, to, is to the, what's, he says, what's the point of examining it before? There's some wonderful Latin, which I've forgotten, tui something and tui after and this kind of stuff, some of you may recall. He says, before you're born, there's nothing. Before you're, after you die, there's nothing. So just pay attention to your life and, and, re, and live a modest, uh, carefree, uh, enjoyable life. And I think he's a hero, Epicurus had it correct. But now there is something after death. We have, we have this option. It doesn't have to end in death. My wife and I each have, each have one of these, and we're busy funding them, as you can see. We'll sell anything else we have. <laughs> but um, I'm sure that I will die, probably not with a smile on my face, but I won't die with a lot of grief, if I know that's there, because I'm in the hands of other humanists. The society I work towards is going to have to carry me. The way Jesus carried that guy across the beach and the guy said, there's only one set of 
footprints there. He says, yes, I was carrying you, don't forget, you know? I mean, uh, it, it's that sort of thing. That's what society is worth. It's our institutions. Right now, there's insufficient respect for institutions, not, not just of humanism, but of religion, you know, in, in general. In North America and in the UK, humanists are seen as anti-religious. They're just stirring up, making fun of people, especially fundamentalists. Richard Dawkins does this, a once respected scientist, picks on the Muslims. And yet these are the people that for, for thousands of years are guilty of having humanist aspiration. And these Anglophone humanists, as I call them, because luckily the reason I'm here today is your community of non-Anglo human humanists are humanists in the true sense of the word. So the Anglophone ones have to clean up their idea that humanism is some kind of a contest with fundamentalist religion because it is not. In fact, I think we can we can we can subsume, we can package everybody as a humanist inside the major religions and leave the major religions as cultural expressions. Because let me read a little bit more here because I cover that a little bit, a little bit here anyway. The future visions of cyborgs are abnegations of everyday human experience. I mean, we can't lose that and pretend nothing's happened. The broad assumption is that the self is found in our brains, but that is mistaken because the brain is just one, albeit major organ in our body. I call it a temporal, time-dependent data diaper because it just soaks up data and it's committed to homeostasis, which is regulating our body over a single lifetime, life cycle. That's what the brain does. It's not where the self is. The actual seat of consciousness lies within our DNA, our genotype, phenotype. Our genotype is all the possible genes built into our DNA, all the possible genes we can express. Our phenotype is the ones that we are expressing in this generation. So that's your body. And there's a copy of that in every one of our 30 trillion living cells. Now that is architecture. Just saying the brain is the seat of everything is gratuitous. We live on planet DNA, this tiny little planet, which is your own DNA. It's, it's unique in the universe. It did not exist before you were born. It's up to you to make sure it stays around and build a society that looks after it all the time. That's DNA stewardship. So, why toss it onto the fire at the end? In the second volume of the Humanist series, Continuance, Pope Francis, that's my second book. It's around here somewhere. Nobody reads it. Um, Pope Francis, who like Salva Salvatore Puleda, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, another famous humanist, he, Pope Francis is trained in chemistry. And in my book, he recognizes that a regenerated celebrity, Johnny Cash, who is in the book, the second book, Continuance, that his existence has redefined our species' mode of reproduction. He says, well, if this happened, it's real. Anybody can see it's him. You can listen to his voice. It's him. As I say here, I told you I was radical. Anyway. Papa agrees with his Buenos Aires Jesuit subordinate, Leahy, 
who contacts him in an effort to revise the, the Catholic sacraments. Because Leahy, his Irish friend from North America, he says, geez, you know, there's a lot of ritual from going to here. It, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's birth, it's death, it's, 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 it's going to heaven. Yeah, and, and, and uh, Pope Francis agrees. Yeah, we, we should update this. Anyway, tw uh, extended rituals and the probable results would validate two millennia of Catholic trust and piety. Of course, at the end of the book, the humanists have to rescue the Pope. The, the clerics don't like any of that. They're very comfortable. As a network designer and writer, my interest since childhood has been to find a roadmap around death. I remember I was sitting at my desk. I was 10 years old. I just passed a scripture test with 90%. In those days, I used to come first in my class. My math wasn't good enough <laughs> to continue that. And I said to myself, if these guys believe this, I must be a philosopher. <laughs> um, after university, I rejected Anglophone philosophy, which is called linguistic analysis, as an international Oxbridge cult. In other words, it's a racket, as they say in New York. Uh, and it's been going on for a, a hundred years. They colonized North America. They colonized Australia. They, of course, colonized the UK with the British analytic tradition, which is just, what do you mean by the word it? They haven't, and they've been doing this for 100 years, and there hasn't been one idea come out of it. They ruined philosophy in all the Anglophone countries. There's no excuse for such movement philosophies to be so barren of ideas, which is why humanism has to fill this gap, but that gap is there to fill. So I am sympathetic to all major religions being vessels containing the essence of humanism, human aspiration, like a school of salmon circling impatiently be below a dam, humans long to continue upstream and begin one more life the present one being spent soon enough. As a dominant species, now at the pinnacle of its powers, humanity understands implicit that we are capable of much more. Yet our imaginations can do little more than speculate. That's where transhumanism comes from. As Thoreau commented, men lead lives of quiet desperation. This is where I become radically conservative, a real oxymoron. I am actively administering a society, that's the red dot, dot up on the wall, on Patreon, I'm not selling anything, <laughs> that is dedicated to preserving its members indefinitely. In other words, just doing the same thing that I'm doing. It's low tech. I've explained to you about how you do that and, and there's, there's a second level where you can put tissues in bio, bio banks because I had a pathologist uh, and who was my neighborhood, in, in a neighbor, and he said, you would really want tissue samples to do that. Cryonics is a bio bank. In other words, they keep their tissues frozen. One, one more placeholder for time to bless. May, may it work out for them. What about anti-aging and life extension? Isn't that important? No. At best, we would resemble ancient Cuban cars, long past their due dates at the junkyard. Poorly posed as issues. That's not how you do it. Living past 85, and I'm 76, it's, it's life extension, do, no. This project is not about immortality or longevity. I'm not talking about living forever. The idea is if infertility is going to go to zero, this is a way 
to keep it from getting there. I think women would would thank us if if we found a way to make ectogenesis. Excuse me. You have yes? just the last five minutes. Thank you. Excuse me for interrupting you. <laughs> that's that's fine. It's just about right. So my first volume, A Thousand Summers, describes humanists dedicating the next millennium to harmonizing with our species, sisters, species, and planet, gaining additional life cycles within that span. No reason why we can't have two, three, four, five life cycles in a, in a millennium. Their lives do not have to be immediate or contiguous. DNA stewardship is a time machine. Smart contracts on the Ethernet blockchain provide the gestation and the childhood funding. The Humanist Union, which is the society I'm founding, are blockchain adjudicators. They oversee smart funding reserved for gestation and, and, and childhood. It may take many decades before something like ectogenesis, artificial wombs, become routine. But nobody can deny that this roadmap should get us there. Compared to mind leaps like cloud consciousness, the faithful who built the catacombs understand this initiative. Consider for a moment, this is the end here, how humanism will be validated if nuclear weapons and militarism are eliminated. A Navy ship, for example, would be seen as a stark monument to human failure its funding stolen from the poor, because it is exactly that. The United Nations would, would afford protection to every canton, as, in, as it is organized in Switzerland. All current defense budgets would be remitted as the UN's own funding. Collective species security is finally realized under the UN. Social democracy ensures that the 1% pay their share. DNA stewardship makes the funeral industry something else. Leading a life of dissipation, being a meth addict, and just running yourself into the ground would hurt a lot more if you knew you were missing your next life cycle. Finally, the three founders of humanism, as I see them, are Confucius, Christ, and Muhammad. <clears throat> uh, Confucius taught responsibility. Christ taught compassion, Muhammad taught science and maturity. <clears throat> Integration of humanism into religion can be anticipated. If we view humanists as special guardians of our identity around which the new religions identify themselves, and align themselves. As with the deep respect for our ancestors, the idea that your genes will return as the unique constitution they have in you defines aspiration. If everyone is born a humanist, with religion remaining private, then each faith's practices remain its own. Confucius's analects are the authority on social and personal probity and should be taught for another thousand summers to continue his legacy. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight Giver Jones, for having presented us uh, your point of view on humanism and human diet uh, and diabetes, uh, militaries, and all the, the very interesting things you, you, you talk about. If there are any questions, please uh, write in the chat. Uh, or, or, or you can use the emoticon uh, uh, here uh, on the right and uh, raise your hands. Okay, there is also a, um, a question in the chat. I don't know if uh, uh, Katerina wants to uh, to speak or, or and, and yeah please hi um thank you for for uh your nice presentation and 
it was more like a commentary and something that you mentioned that really um, made me think that now since the COVID-19 pandemic, people are very worried about getting the disease and dying. And um, even though there have been many times in the history of, this is not the pandemic that has been in the world so far, but I, I would say that people are more distressed about this. And I will ask, how would like, a humanist approach help the distress causing people? And why are they so afraid of dying? Because as you mentioned, it is a natural step in our life cycle. Thank you. Sorry, can I understand your, your, your question again, uh, Catherine? Your, um, what, what do you want me to comment on? I, did, I didn't get the gist of the question. Okay. Um, how can a humanist approach help these distress causing people since the COVID-19 pandemic, if, if in any way? Well, humanism should be critics uh, as well as apologists of our species. And I think in something as important as lockdowns and destroying the economies of, 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 uh, of, of major nations, when, when there is so little mortality and there's so little responsibility for the care of, of our elders, we need medical direction to deal with their malnutrition. They, they, should, have, they should have noticed very early and a year ago it was very obvious that most of the people that were dying and made up the, uh, the dead uh, were, were old people who were sick uh, and, 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 and overweight perhaps, but largely deficient in vitamin D. So right away, they denied everything we learned in, in TB sanitariums. They wouldn't even spend one cent on, on a vitamin D pill to, to, to justify what we learned in those sanitariums. So the medical authorities, to answer your question, they don't want to be exposed by that. They, they, they don't want, you will not see the word vitamin D mentioned by an epidemiologist because it's our central hormone for fighting this, for fighting upper respiratory. It's, it's, it's the simplest thing you can learn. You probably learned it in high school. So they don't want the discussion to be about vitamin D when it can be about billion dollar vaccines that come every year and pick up a new variant every three months. And then every, everybody can go home and never go back to work, but they don't care. You have to understand that American doctors especially have no knowledge of nutrition and they don't care about it. They will tell you that carbohydrates are plant-based because they are told to say that by their lobbyists. It's a rogue nation, it's completely corrupt and you can't be following that. Okay, thank you. There are any more questions? Are there? Maybe not. So uh, I thank you again, and uh, we can move to the the last section that there are the conclusions. And thank you, Francesca. <laughs> thank you.